in, it's this, the seed pod. And we think that this may have been an incredibly important food to our ancestors. We know that the wetlands were larger and greater at that period, and we also know that in other parts of the world, water lilies form part of a staple diet. And that's what we've come here to collect. I think there's some bigger ones up ahead of us there, aren't there? We've found that fresh yellow water lily seeds are incredibly bitter, eaten raw or roasted. But we've read of the Klamath tribe in Oregon who would ferment their seeds, so we're going to try that. It's an unusual method, but it's an efficient way to collect the seeds, which sink as the pods rot away over several days. Oh, that looks all right, doesn't it? It does look good. And let's see what the seeds are like. Well, there's a lot of uh, really liberated seeds here. Um, so although we've got a few fruits that haven't gone, of course, we've, we've only had a week, haven't we? Since we gathered these. It looks wonderful, doesn't it? Of course, what people at home might realise is what it smells like. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's part of the delight, isn't it? Um, <laughs> this, is a, this is a potent brew indeed. I think yeah. this is a golden special. But so you're going to sort all those out? Yes, we'll decant off the, 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 the gut from the top and... Uh, I'll go and get a fire going. And we'll um, start grinding them? Yeah. Good. Good. The fermentation mimics the natural ripening process and means the seeds should be far less bitter. This is dead hemlock stems. You might not think to use this for fire lighting, and uh, certainly wouldn't want to try using it green because it's so poisonous, but when it's dead, it's all right. And in Lapland, the Sami, when they go up into the mountains, they carry with them dead angelica stalks, which are very similar to this. And the reason being is that they burn good and hot, and they're very light, so they could easily carry with them what they needed to make their brew fire while they're out looking after the reindeer. Well, here we have it, Ray. Clean seed. Look at that. Well, oh, that's a good harvest. Well, we're in business, aren't we? We are indeed. Ready for grinding. We're going to need some leaves, aren't we, as well? Yes, we will. Uh, what do you reckon? Well, I saw some giant water dock. Yeah, I that's, think that's, be that's, that sounds ideal there. I'll grab a couple of those. They're non-toxic and they're big, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. They've got very flowery innards. You can see the flower being liberated. And but they're a bit tough. Of course, they're not half as tough to grind as they would be if we'd uh, parched them or, or roasted them first. We, uh, that would have turned them into little rubber balls that are completely ungrindable. But uh, uh, nevertheless, it's going to take a bit of work to get these cracked. All the best leaves were, of course, on the other side of the river. <laughs> as always. Just take the midrib off the back of these leaves and then I will wilt them on the fire, like this. If I, if I wilt these leaves, they will become very soft, like a, like a little bit of chamois. And we can wrap this material that Gordon's grinding up in here and cook it in little parcels on the fire. One of my great pet hates in kind of modern backwards camping, if you like, is people using aluminium foil. I can't stand the stuff because it it gets thrown in the fire, it doesn't rot away, and it stays there forever. And it's just not necessary. There are so many leaves that we could use to do the same jobs, and all alternative methods that are usually better, they're more fun and more tasty, and uh, non-polluting. Good nettle here, actually, Gordon. I think this one may give us all the string we need. Actually. Now, this uh, way of getting the fibres out isn't something I learned from any sort of book. I just sat down one day and played with nettles until it presented itself. Now, Gordon, that's beginning to look like concrete. Yes, I suspect this uh, shaly slate has contributed a little powder of its own, a little bit of rock powder, and uh, turned the otherwise white flower from the centre of each of these seeds into a subtle shade of grey. 
I'm more concerned about the binding effect it might <laughs> <have>. <laughs> Yeah. So we've got string, Brilliant. we've got leaves. Well, and we've got we've got some I've got sludge. I'm sure our ancestors would have eaten worse. Through our experiments, we're refining our knowledge. And that's the fun of it, because Britain has many forgotten wild foods if we could only rediscover how to use them. This is how I can fold that in. Yes, indeed. And it really does do up into a neat package. That's really quite superb, I must admit. Like that. And then if I take a bit of the nettle, Add that round. Perfect. These techniques aren't as arbitrary as they look. With a bit of experience, you can judge things very finely. And fire is one of the things I find really interesting. Because fire is not just simple, it's not just the fire. Mm. You know, I've made the right type of fire for this type of cooking. It's quite small, but I've got good hot embers, and I've chosen firewood that will give us good ash, so that I've got a lot of ash around the thing. Right. It reduces the oxygen and the risk of, cons yeah. of the thing being consumed by the fire. So fire is actually a very sophisticated thing. Well, Gordon, I'm looking at that thinking, I, we should try that now. Let's give it a spin. So it's not gone hard inside. It stayed soft. Right. Which I'm not surprised at, because it's kind of a steaming. Now, last time I cooked something for you, it tasted good, didn't it? You've gone quiet. <laughs> Try. Still bitter. Yes, that's very bitter. <laughs> that's disgusting. But despite that astringent bitterness, mm. my mouth's very dry now, it, um, there's a, it really is, you can really sense the food it has yeah, the potential to be. I'm it. having trouble talking now, my <laughs> mouth is so dry. <laughs> <laughs> and it just shows you how specific the knowledge is with regards to these foods. It's, there's nothing haphazard about it. It's got to be done right. That's right. Well, you see, that's the problem of television, isn't it? Because the truth of the matter is the production crew are all going on holiday, aren't they? <laughs> and we had to do this a week ahead of time. I think we should make the crew all eat some, don't you think? Uh, I think that's fair, fair dues, fair dues. Hey, what happens? <laughs> oh, no, you don't. Here you are, Joe. Actually, that's all right. <laughs> Keep chewing. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it comes through later, doesn't it? Oh, that's foul. <laughs> that's really... <laughs> <laughs> so Gordon, I dare you to eat it all. I give you a pound. <laughs> <laughs> you need more than that for the coffee in the hospital <laughs> canteen machine. What does it taste like if you do the two weeks? Like you tasted it to start with. OK. So nutty, uh, all right. Sweet, nutty, uh, mm. nutty, yes, that's right. It is actually it has a sweetness because uh, it's, it's um, um, high carbohydrate content, being slightly caramelised, forms sugars when you when you heat it. Mm. Gordon, that was one of the most bitter things you've ever mm. got me to eat. That was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> that was remarkable. It's hard to imagine a time when the British landscape wasn't shaped by man. But in the Mesolithic, we were still one influence amongst many, which included herds of wild horses and ancient auric. There is evidence which could suggest humans burnt reed beds, and certainly open fenland like this would have been a prime hunting ground, with game tempted out of cover by fresh green shoots. For our ancestors, this would have been a sight to gladden the heart of any Mesolithic hunter. Because, of course, in those days, horses were very much part of the diet. What's interesting is that the landscape 